Uh, normally at this point, we actually look at a uh, Greenlandinga saga, the saga of the Greenlanders. Uh, there are two uh, extant, substantial uh, accounts of uh, the Scandinavian discovery of Vinland of North America. Uh, Greenlandinga saga is one of them, and the saga of Eric the Red, Eric the Red saga, uh, Eric in, in Rodin saga, or something like that, if I remember my old notes. Uh, but I couldn't find a version of Greenlandinga saga online, so we had to do uh, Eric the Red Saga instead. They're very similar in various ways, but they have their differences. I think Eric the Red Saga might be slightly longer. That's the only difference here. So for those of you who have the text, and for those of you, perhaps even smaller group, those who've actually tried to do some reading of the text, okay, we'll spend the next 20 minutes or so uh, thinking about this text from the perspective of the historian. You can say. I like it because it, it's like a narrative, but I think it seems to me a bit complicated because of the names and the author's style of his explanation. Can I have the text there? Because it may be different from my translator. I'm just looking. I download it from the Yeah, no, that's okay. I, I, but I have my own copy in different translation. I know. Some difficulties to follow the story, so can you, uh, could you be a bit detailed while discussing the text? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, there is a mistake here. I'm fairly certain that what you, it says the saga of Eric the Red, but in fact, this is the Greenlandinga saga, because it has all the stuff about Bjarni Herjolfsson and things like that. I wouldn't read the text through, I just said it's so. So there is a mistake on this website. So you, in fact, do have Greenlandinga saga rather than Eric the Red. So that one is a, is a mistake. That's interesting. Um, because one of the big differences between the two sagas is the point of uh, connecting uh, who first sees uh, Vinland and, uh, and so on. Uh, and in uh, Greenlandinga saga, it's this guy, Bjarni Herjolfsson, who kind of gets swept away from Greenland and sees this land and so on. But in Eric the Red saga, it's his son, uh, Eric's son, Leif, who gets swept away and sees it uh, and so on. So uh, we do, in fact, have green. So I should email. Uh, what's his name? Paul Halsell, or whatever he's called, and so you need to change that on your site and so on. So, Ejem, what were you saying again? What was your question? You found it complicated? Uh, yes, because of his explaining the story like Roman and always saying anything else uh, and uh, jumping from different point into the another one. And so I had some difficulties to follow the story, but I liked it, as I said. Well, I can't remember all the details, but um, not, not just maybe. well, can someone? At, firstly, I'd like to see if one of the rest of you, because this is the point when you're supposed to be telling me things. I spend all my time talking. So, uh, if anyone has read Eric the Red Saga, that is in fact Greenlandinga Saga, from what I can see, uh, does anyone want us to give us a, a very broad summary of yes. the text? Yeah, okay. I mean, I can give a very, very, very brief one, um, but I'd rather think that someone else who hopefully, more than just Edgem, has had a read. Uh, okay. Well, you can start us off, Edgem, and then we can add things to it. What's your, what's your impression of this story? I mean, what's it, what's it about? Uh, the author is talking about 
why I'm reading the text. Because I don't know the old names of the text exactly. And also, it doesn't explain where he was talking about uh, a specific place of the world. So, Okay, all right, okay. Anyone else have a go at reading the text? Anyone else wish to give us a uh, breakdown, a summary of the plot or of the main events? May not be in chronological order. Okay, uh, Ravel. Um, so, what I got from it was that um, Leif was uh, the son of Eric the Red, and he, it kind of starts off talking about the virtues of Leif and how his dad knows that he's going to be a good, uh, like, successful man and how he's very virtuous. And then he goes out and uh, he tries to find his father by going sailing to Greenland to meet him. Uh, but he gets lost along the way and sees the American coast, is what I'm kind of assuming. And then as, as he's on, like, I assume it's the American coast, he, but he refuses to land there. He doesn't want to because it, it doesn't look like Greenland. And so he, they kind of come back, and then they, find, they finally find Greenland because he notices the big icy mountains. Hmm. So that's more like Eric the Red. Maybe, I mean, maybe this text, which is on this usually very reliable site, is a kind of mixture of the two versions. I'm beginning to think this now, because some of the things that we saw just then, uh, the information about Bjarni Herjolfsson um, is uh, definitely in um, uh, Greenland Inga saga. Uh, when we have Leif doing his thing, then that's, uh, and getting lost, that's in Eric the Red saga. So it might be, I'll have to look at it more carefully, it's my fault for not necessarily reading the whole thing and assuming that this was a reliable translation and so on. But, um, okay, let me summarise things very, very basically for you, okay? We'll go a bit of background as well first, just so we, we, uh, we know. Let's go back then to some of the things we were talking about on Tuesday in our last class. I mean, basically in a very, very general sense, starting probably in the 8th century, um, people from what is now Norway uh, making their way in these slightly improved boats that they had to the islands to the north of Britain, uh, the Shetlands and Orkneys and so on, evidence of settlement there. Uh, then finding their way to the Faroe Islands, where they still speak uh, 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 Norse language. And then from there, a natural step westwards is to Iceland, okay, which uh, was the sort of big... Uh, uh, discovery in that sense and has its, had it developed its own identity. Sorry, you said they speak still Norse language? In the Faroe Islands they speak Faroese, which is kind of halfway between Icelandic and Norwegian. So it, I think the grammar is slightly simpler than uh, modern Icelandic and Old Norse, but it's not quite as uh, similar to English as, for example, Norwegian is. But they still speak, uh, and we have uh, one or two books on it in the library, I should add, as well, if you want to look at that. Um, and then at some point, round about 1,000, perhaps, uh, allegedly, uh, Eric the Red or, or other people, because I think he was following uh, uh, hints from someone else, uh, disc uh, went and discovered uh, what becomes known as Greenland. And Eric the Red uh, was a, uh, uh, an imaginative guy, so he, in one of the sagas it says, he decided to call it Greenland because it would attract people. It wasn't very green, it wasn't very hospitable, but by calling it Greenland, all the people in Iceland who were perhaps unable to find land or people over still in Norway said, oh, we'll go over to that place that Eric set up and we'll go and, uh, uh, and, and join him over there because it sounds quite nice or whatever. Yeah, yep. Well, OK, look, we, we're kind of jumping ahead of ourselves because what I really wanted to do, uh, in a sense, as a background, oh, I'm sorry, that's the one of my texts to come, was to say a little bit more about the sagas in general and about 
um, the nature of this evidence and what we can and what we cannot say from it. So at the moment I'm just kind of telling you a story. I'm mixing a bit of historical stuff with a bit of the story as we've got it here in a sense, okay? Um, and again, so then depend someone, some people who were trying to reach uh, uh, Greenland uh, kind of missed it and ended up somehow uh, sailing along here and finding uh, the coast of some part of what is now Canada uh, and so on. Okay, who the details are we don't know. Eric's supposed to have uh, found Greenland or he followed some uh, someone else's hints and so on and then the same with what becomes known as Wineland, Vinland over here. So they're kind of accidental discoveries uh, in a sense in that way. But we won't go into the names too much. This is what we get from the sagas and that's uh, methodologically uh, the next stage. Okay. So they tell the story of uh, basically uh, to some extent the story of the discovery of Greenland and then connected to that uh, this, um, um, uh, this discovery of what we are fairly certain now is uh, the coast of Canada um, and perhaps Newfoundland down here uh, and the attempts to set up some kind of a community there for a while uh, and their interaction with the uh, uh, what we used to call sort of American Indians or something, Eskimos, people don't like that, Canadians very much don't like Eskimos, I know, so we're Inuits or whatever, uh, who are called Skralings. Uh, by the Vikings. And then eventually this uh, attempt at occupying and setting a little settlements there break down and they leave and things like that. Okay? That very broadly is the kind of story. Okay? Discovery of Greenland, discovery of Vinland, uh, trying to settle there and then it fails. They fight a bit with the Skralings and that's it. That's a very rough thing. Now let's firstly look at this, okay? which is my attempt uh, in a very basic way to kind of reconstruct the textual history of what we've got. Because um, these sagas and the other sagas written by uh, Icelanders uh, during the Central and later Middle Ages are very attractive sources. They're very well written. They're great pieces of literature. Okay? They have great characters and so on. And apart from the bits where they give long genealogies, which we don't quite so much connect with ourselves, but the Icelanders would have picked up all sorts of things. It just says, there's a guy called David who was son of da-da, who was son of da-da-da-da. That sounds boring to us, but in the sagas, that tells all sorts of things to the, the readers of who they're connected to, where they come from, their supposed character and things like that. But uh, apart from that for us, the rest of it is still very readable, I find. You find it quite uh, a pleasant read, if a little bit confusing at times. So there is this danger of being kind of sucked in and thinking, oh, this must be great, it must be true, and, and writing history. And I talked all about this last time. Um, here is uh, very roughly, and I'm not saying it's kind of the latest state-of-the-art understanding of these two sagas, but I think more or less roughly this is some uh, a breakdown of, of things. And I can suppose add here as a kind of little add. Other references, because there are a small, in a few manuscripts, a few texts here and there, a few other references to Vinland and Greenland and so on, which uh, may or may not be connected to these in some way, or I don't know the details there. Basically, we've got two texts, the Saga of the Greenlanders and Eric the Red Saga, and maybe what you've got there is somehow an amalgam of those. Okay, And they were written at some point in the 13th century, both of them. Okay? It's believed that they were first written down by someone during the 13th century. Someone sat down and wrote these things down in some form. But we don't have them. I put brackets here. We don't have those original copies. We don't have the first ever composed version of that. We assume that the person who wrote these things down uh, was not completely making it up. He, more, most fairly certainly a he of one sort or another, was not just kind of sitting down and let me make up a story uh, or whatever. Okay? He was using traditions and stories that he'd been told and he was putting them together. And these two texts clearly are going back to some kind of a common original event, which of course is this discovery uh, occupation of, of Vinland by uh, Leif Erikson and his pals and things like that which people think probably around about the year 1000. We're not being very specific, so I've got the kirka there. So we begin with the fact that the Vikings did make it to northern Canada, and they did settle there, okay? 
dot, 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 oral tradition, all things being changed over time and so on. 200, 250, whatever it is, years ago, uh, we get two attempts at writing these traditions down in some way. Okay. So event first, written down next. And a few other scattered references survive as well to these things. Uh, okay, yeah. Greenlandinga saga. Okay. Saga, yes. It means, uh, there should be an A here, in fact, Greenlandinga saga. It means that the Greenlandings are the people of Greenland. Uh, a is the genitive plural. Uh, we don't want to go all that. You have enough of that in Latin. Okay, so it's the saga of the Greenland, Greenlander people or something like that. Um, we don't have now anyone surviving who can tell us exactly what happened because they all died uh, over a thousand years ago. We don't have the original written versions, okay. But we do have a selection of uh, very uh, important Icelandic manuscripts which survive from the later Middle Ages and uh, which contain many, many sagas. Flat Eyjar book and Hauk's book are the two most uh, famous ones and also Skowl Holt's book uh, is the one here. And this is roughly the dates that I think they were, uh, these manuscripts were, were compiled, we should say. End of the 14th century, Hauk's book earlier, early part of the 14th century, and I've got either around about 1420 or I've also had references to late 15th century for uh, Skowl Holt's book. Um, but all of them, therefore, uh, 100, 200 uh, years later than the original uh, composition. So our question, of course, is what's going on here, what's going on kind of here, here, and here. We have two versions of Eric the Red Saga. Okay, in those two, we've got one very early one here, and then we've got a series of copies later on, but they're clearly copies, so we don't worry. These are not uh, particularly important, okay, because we can see that they're copied from uh, the ones that we have in that sense. So, in terms of our understanding of these events, um, we've got all the things that oral tradition can do, where people will change things, forget things, or whatever. Then we've got the decisions made by two individual composers to write these two sagas and what they did for artistic purposes, because they're not recording for your benefit or my benefit. They have uh, some desire to have uh, a good story uh, here, so they will be twisting things a bit, I suspect. And then we have to worry about how accurately their manuscripts were transmitted and then written up by the people who put together uh, these books and things. So we've got a number of steps that take us back to what really happened. Now, did anyone watch that video? Anyone have a chance to watch the video I put on Moodle as well? Okay, uh, that, dis that describes the discovery of uh, the Viking settlement in, in Lanso Meadows there and so on. When we actually have some separate, uh, in this case, archaeological evidence that shows probably fairly um, incontrovertibly that some people of Scandinavian origin were living for a little while in uh, that part of Canada, then uh, we can say, ah, well then, what does that say about these two texts, about this text that we have here? Okay. Now, as historians, if we get the archaeological stuff, what does that or doesn't it say anything about this? Once we get the archaeological support of something, what does it lead us to say about the contents of these texts? For ex Sorry? Yes, well, um, I, of the two choices that I'd kind of inclined towards what Serkan is saying, to start with and we'll move towards Elif's point afterward. Firstly, bless you, Chok Yesha, it's not completely made up, okay? It's not the figment of someone's imagination at some point in my little diagram there. There is some support, the Vikings did get there. The next question is, who was that? Was it Leif Erikson? Um, was it all these pit names and things which Jeb Jim was saying, it's all a bit confusing, different people. Were, were these events the actual events? Now, in my mind, we would have to say possibly not. Firstly, because we do have some differences between these sagas. Okay. 
when we have two accounts of something, um, whether it's historical events, whether it's two people in a court of law saying, he done it, he killed him, and the other person saying, no, he didn't, or whatever, okay, either of those uh, situations. When we have two um, accounts of the same event, uh, more or less, uh, but they're different, there's significant differences between them, um, what options do we have? Before we start to say, well, you know, I like people uh, with uh, a certain colour hair, so she's right, or something, before we get to that point, uh, just what options have we got? We've got two accounts, but they're different. So what does that mean? What possibilities do we have in front of us before we begin to weigh the, them up in detail? One could be more correct than the other, or they both could be entirely incorrect. Yes. Uh, one of them uh, can be more reliable. They, well, they both might have some truth and some falsehood in. Uh, one of them may be more accurate than the other one. Or they're both making it up. Okay, and there's a third option which we no longer have, which is the truth or something like that. Uh, and it's kind of similar here. Okay? Before we start worrying about Bjarni as opposed to Leaf and all these kind of things, we say, okay, well, what options have we got in these two traditions? One of them may be telling the truth. Maybe they've both got bits of the truth and they've both introduced some uh, falsehoods during the line and so on. Um, or it could be that Eric the Red Saga is more reliable in its account than the Greenlandinga Saga or whatever. And we'll leave it to the uh, uh, textual experts or whatever to sort of solve that problem. Um, but for us, it does create the issue of uh, certainty. We can never be that certain. Uh, in my mind, if someone asked me to say, you know, tell me about the Norse discovery of uh, America, uh, I might mention the name Leif Erikson because he is a common point between these, so there is some connection there. Um, but the details of the story and the other people involved and so on, I would be very nervous about uh, mentioning those. Okay? I think beyond saying something like someone, Norse people probably found America when they were trying to reach Greenland and someone involved in this was called Leif Erikson, but whether he was the first one or not is, is not clear. That's about as far as I would go from the, from the whole of this book in that sense. Okay? Um, but if you go online, if you borrow some of the books from the library, you'll probably find a more substantial account that does describe these kind of things here. Um, yep. Well, this is what I've got here. Okay. This, this, this is this is how this is what we've got substantially. These are the manuscripts which survive from the late Middle Ages, which have the oldest surviving copies of these accounts. There's one of Greenland Inga Saga, as far as I know, and there are these two versions, slightly different, but more or less the same, uh, of Eric the Red Saga. We assume that these two must be based upon a common original, and they think it was written round about this time or later. And uh, it's suggested that the original version of this story in this manuscript goes back to 13th century as well at some point. Okay. But that's it. Okay. We don't have these. Okay. We've got these later ones. And our question mark is all sorts of things about who's copying it during the intervening 200 years and what that may or may not mean to the reliability of the text. People adding things in, people saying, oh, hang on. But I heard something differently, so I'm going to change that, and, and all sorts of stuff, okay? Because they're not concerned with transmitting an accurate text. They're trans concerned with transmitting a good story in that sense to a large extent or whatever. Hey, Jim? Uh, just one uh, instead of these uh, original books, or, or not original, but uh, the first ones, uh, the earliest ones, discovery of North America, can we be suspicious about the uh, translations? Instead of these books. Oh, you mean these translations? No, any translations to English or other languages. Maybe they are talking about they are talking about different stories. 
Well, I'm a, bit, I'm a bit suspicious of the translation I made you guys read. I've got to look into that because it, it says Eric the Red Saga and rather uh, foolishly I, I put that up and said Eric the Red Saga, but then I see that some of the content seems to be what I recognise as being from the other one. So there's a mistake there. Uh, what do you mean? I mean, this, this is... Uh, okay, we're not reading... The, uh, it would be great if we could all sit down and read the original uh, Old Norse, the, the old Icelandic versions, which uh, are not that difficult to learn. It's very interesting language and so on but um, that's what if you if you were serious scholars of the Viking period you would learn that language and you would read the originals you would go and see the manuscripts but you're talking about any translation what what do you mean can you uh, uh, can we say that uh, all translators are, are talking about the stories what is explained in these books or maybe they can explain a different story <laughs> according to their interests or yeah. Okay. Well, um, this this um, series of uh, penguin classic translations, which they started doing in the 60s of uh, uh, Icelandic sagas, and uh, the late Magnus Magnusson, who's a very famous British. Uh, uh, Icelandic guy and was on TV and so on, uh, and uh, uh, Hermann Paulsen, who I think was Icelandic scholar, uh, their translations are fairly accurate uh, of these. They, they knew Old Norse for a while and they want to represent the original text. The only criticism I have, and this goes back to, I said before, the genealogies, is that they often in the footnotes they put the extended genealogies of someone. They say, there was this man who was son of him, and there's a little one, and the rest of the genealogy is given at the foot because they think people don't want to read that. Uh, they'll lose interest or whatever. So that's one little editorial or translator's change they've made. Um, again, I have to look again at what we've got here to, to feel clear about what I've given you, and next time I may have to change the text or, or use a photocopy or something as I used to do. But uh, are you talking more generally about the problem of translating historical or any material and um, uh, what that means for uh, students of history or, or are you talking more specifically about these and that there is a danger of these people changing it or well, there's both I mean there is the natural problem that unless you read it in the original language there's always a danger that you're reading someone else's interpretation that there's a whole vast scholarly field of translation studies that we won't go into uh, for these ones uh, for your particular text, yes, I'll have to look at that. Um, these guys, I'm fairly certain, are relatively accurate in terms of what they try and represent from the original one in that sense. Um, so we always have to be a little bit careful, yes. So we could draw a, another line here and here or whatever and put trans or something like that and say that there's another stage of, of uncertainty that's being introduced in that sense. But uh, um, for our purposes, we have to assume the text is, is reliable because we're trying to get back to the further point in that way. But before the translation, we have five copies, four copies, so it's even difficult to tell. I mean, it's already distorted in a sense. Yeah, every time you go, you go that little bit further away from the original events. Uh, you're introducing human error. Human error in historical documents can be of all sorts. Okay? It can be accidental. When you're copying and you're tired, you're sitting in a monastery in the north of England somewhere or whatever and it's cold, you make mistakes. For example, a very, very common mistake which copyists in the Middle Ages made, someone thinking which in French is known as saute du même au même, a jump from the same or from like to the same which, strangely enough, my son did recently. He was trying to copy out some book. He said, I'm making a summary of this book, and he started copying all the pages out, which wasn't a summary, it was just copying it, but this was his idea. But there was someone's name on one page, and then he was up to that point, and then when he looked down, wrote, he looked up, he saw the name again, but it was a later version of that name, and then he carried on. He missed all the words in between. Things like that, okay? Scribes make those mistakes all the time, and historians get to recognize those. Uh, particularly if you've got two versions, you can see where the mistake's made. The more dangerous thing, of course, if you don't have two to compare, you've only got one, you don't know that something's been missed out necessarily. In addition to those kind of uh, accidental errors, there are deliberate things that people will introduce, okay? Um, a good example of this is now there are some classical... Um, there are one or two references to very early references in Roman sources 
uh, to Jesus and Christians. Okay? They don't go all the way back to the time when Jesus meant to have lived, but there are accounts that refer to uh, uh, early Christians in some Roman sources. Now, the thing is that all of these have survived all of these Roman documents have survived because they were copied later by Christians. And one of these very early references, it refers to Jesus and it says, who was the Son of God? And then immediately you're thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, the, Tacitus or whoever it was wouldn't write that because that, he was not a Christian. So clearly some medieval scribe has added that in at some point and we don't have the, the original thing. So there's that kind of thing. Some of them very, very obvious, others more subtle. And then all these question marks are these human interactions with the text, with the events that change and so on. So our problem here, we haven't actually got into the text very much at all, but maybe that's not so important because we don't think it's necessary true uh, step by step. Uh, the lesson we learn, if anything, from this, uh, it's ended up being me talking again all the time, hasn't it, but uh, is that uh, even for something as simple as this little book, we end up with a complicated, relatively complicated diagram. And many medieval texts have got far more complicated uh, uh, stemmers for understanding their, their history and so on. And each line that leads us from one place to the other involves human agency deliberately or accidentally introducing some kind of interpretation or change or mistake sometimes, not always. Uh, and it's, uh, it's only as you move further back that you hope you can reconstruct what happened. And here we can't, we can't even really hope. When we have the archaeological evidence, the Vikings are there, at least the Serkan says, we can say, yes, they did go there. The basic idea is correct. But how far we can go into these stories and say this detail is correct, this is accurate, it's very dangerous. And as I've been trying to stress all the time, these sagas were not written, well, very little is written for our benefit to tell us what really happened. They always have a purpose and so on. These are literature. There was no TV, there were no DVDs in 13th century Iceland. People sat around and listened to stories. And then someone ended up writing them down, and sometimes they ended up being read out to other people and things like that. And that's what these things are, and this is one version of that. Right. Any other final suggestions or comments about this? Serka? Um, I just have a couple of questions in mind. Like, we're talking about a common um, ground for these texts to have stemmed from, right? And, like, this actually, this question belonged to the previous class that we had. I was going to ask you whether uh, you've come across any um, evidence of, like, climactic change within that region that made the Vikings move around. Uh, um, yeah, well, that was we mentioned that as one of the possible explanations that people have offered. That um, have you come across any sort of evidence? well, it's I mean I not myself directly. I'm I'm not a an historian of these things. But I, in the secondary books that I've read, I've 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 read people suggesting that there were there might be some evidence. I mean, for climate, you can study things like um, uh, yeah yeah. Do you, are you all familiar with? Um, Dendrochronology. I mean, with that famous term, exciting term. Basically, every year trees grow a little bit bigger. Okay, and uh, if you cut a tree uh, around the middle, you see these things called the tree rings. Okay, and certain kinds of trees will grow at the same rate in the same area because they've experienced the same kind of weather conditions: good year, bad year, or whatever. So this tree and the same kind of tree next to it will have the, more or less the same relative proportions of growth. Uh, they won't be exactly the same because they're different trees, different sizes. So you can then take, uh, you can reconstruct the weather in an area by comparing back in time uh, the, the rings from successive trees. Uh, and you can say, okay, here obviously was a good time. It's all relative at this point. We're not fixing dates onto it and so on. Um, well, they, they begin to do that. Uh, of course, then when you dig up wood from somewhere, you can say, well, this boat must have been made 
after that time because it's made with a, a tree which has, say, up to here, but doesn't have those rings. So it must have been uh, chopped down at a certain point and it gives you some kind of thing. So dendrochronological study can, is one of the ways, I think, where they can look at the changes in, in climate in certain places over certain times. But what's going on in, in Ireland as opposed to what's going on in the southern France will be different because the conditions there are, are different. So probably studying uh, dendrochronological evidence or even modern trees, if they're very old ones, from Scandinavia might give a picture of what's going on. But I, uh, I'm kind of, that's more guesswork in a sense. It's my experience with these sort of texts has been that uh, some of these texts were created because, or the oral tradition were created in order to explain uh, population movements? Well, that's more, yeah, that's more um, kind of people. That, well, okay, there is one very big, uh, very early Icelandic text called Landnáma book, and that basically tells who arrived first in which bit of Iceland and, and the history of that particular farm or region and so on. And we could treat that as an origin or, or tribal uh, legend in a sense. And tribal legends, tribal stories from Africa or, or anywhere or surviving written down from elsewhere uh, are seen as these kind of group histories which then uh, they tell us more about uh, what's going on in their perception of the past rather than what really happened in the past. Yeah, we would have, uh, I'm sorry, we would have like a royal family or some sort of a figurehead. Um, his or her story being imposed upon the actual family. Yeah, now th these Icelandic sagas are a little bit different, uh, the society partly and things, but it just becomes that the Icelanders, for whatever reason, as Christianity had spread and by into the 13th century especially, uh, and there were a few very, very big figures like Snorri Sturluson, who was one of the most prolific and skilled writers. There were, they just got this thing of writing these stories. Some of them about historical people with a certain amount of historical accuracy, others about that were completely fantastic with monsters and ghosts and things like that. And it's just a, something which they did. Uh, and it overlaps because of the oral background to many of them with these oral traditions and traditions of these pseudo-political uh, stories, but it's not exactly the same, but it's similar, yeah. I think we're pretty much coming up to our time, so let me stop there. I need to talk to uh, Hassan and Bura about next week. Um, we're, if you found this nice set of stories uh, exciting to read, uh, you may have a slightly different experience for next time because we are going to be looking at Doomsday Book, which was one of the greatest creations of the Middle Ages uh, in an historical sense, but it's not the kind of thing that you would sit in bed reading before you go to sleep. Uh, Fatih um, I remembers probably we discussed this a couple of years ago in the British History course when he took it from me, um, but we can't look at... Uh, uh, 11th and 12th century Western European history without thinking a little bit about Doomsday Book because it's one of the greatest creations from that. Uh, I, I can't find at the moment uh, a, a good and substantial English version of part of Doomsday Book. I can't give you the whole thing because it's massive. Uh, so I may have to uh, scan some material and then upload it to Moodle myself. So I'm going to be doing that hopefully by Monday at the latest. Okay. So if you go to Moodle now, you won't find anything, I'm afraid. Okay, have a lovely weekend. And Oksana, thank you for your presentation again.